Good evening. I'm Casey Nolan. Tonight's topic has generated a lot of headlines and demanded a lot of explaining. So tonight, in the past year, what have we learned? And in the next year, where are we going when it comes to health care in this country and in our community? The Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, was signed into law in 2010 upheld by the Supreme Court in 2012, but in many ways 2013 was the year of the ACA. The much anticipated insurance marketplace opened, prompting the passage of a Missouri law barring public officials from helping people sign up. And that wasn't the only challenge. Funny thing, uh, the rollout has not been very smooth, unfortunately, at least. But website glitches aside, much of what has happened with the ACA so far is considered is groundwork Louis, for what's to come in 2014. When new insurance plans go into effect, penalties for the uninsured become a reality, and Missouri's Medicaid expansion debate continues. It's not metastasized to the brain. Tonight, we're taking a look back at health care in 2013, what you need to know, and why it matters for 2014. So stay tuned. So coming up in just a minute here in the studio will be from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Tara Kulash, who will be filling us in on some headlines and deadlines when it comes to health care. But before we do that, let's take a look back over the past year with some familiar faces you will see in just a moment here tonight. Let's take a look at what those familiar faces had to say over this past year about health care. We really need to do something about Medicaid expansion because what we didn't do in Missouri last year is, is huge. So everyone that lives in poverty in Missouri is still uninsured. Well, it, it's a critical role. We have about 500,000 Missourians who are going to be eligible for new coverage. And most of those people, about 80%, eligible for subsidized coverage through the marketplace. We have another 300,000 Missourians who earn under the poverty level for whom there are no premium tax credits. It was when, when they when they formed the Affordable Care Act, the idea was that states were going to expand Medicaid, and so that would take up the coverage for these people that couldn't afford it. I would not be able to get into the exchange, and I would be without health care. And I would be, there would be, I wouldn't be able to have the diagnostic test that I'm able to have now. So can so, we, do we really know what it's going to cost? Not yet. And so we hear a lot from a lot of different people. A lot of people are speculating about what the market will do, what the costs will be, and some of that we just haven't seen yet. What we know now is that the system isn't working. With the shop exchange, these small businesses, they, they're already in a pool. Now, their claims are factored in in terms of adjusting them to where the pool is, but they're not, they're not priced on claims alone. I mean, far from it. Healthcare is scary. You go into your doctor's office and if you don't know the things that they're mentioning, you don't know the drugs they want you to take, you don't know the diseases they're naming, that's, that can be really terrifying. You don't know what you're approaching. When you think about chronic disease, it's a major issue. Um, at the hospitals here in the region, you see a lot of people come into the hospital with congestive heart failure, you get people with diabetes. We are not going to be able to have the traditional model of Marcus Welby uh, one doctor per person. We've got to open it up. And that's on all of us in the medical field and in adjacent fields to make sure that young adults know where to go to get that information. They can't be a good consumer and pick the right MRI or the right doctor to go to without the information. You'll see as the show progresses tonight, you'll be able to distinguish between the professionals and the one student on the show, Nick Semenkovich, because everyone else will be wearing different clothes. Nick just has one dress-up outfit, <laughs> so he'll be wearing the same thing as he was in that look-back piece. But that's okay. He's in school. Um, okay, jokes aside, Tara Kulash, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, we've said this before on the show, your beat is the Affordable Care Act. That yes. means clearly it's generating a lot of news. We know it made a lot of headlines. Uh, catch us up again real, real quickly. What, what were a couple of the big headlines this year? Okay, well, I think uh, one of the most important ones, possibly the most, is uh, October 1st, glitchy website. Nobody could get through. And that's what's been the talk ever since, even when the website started getting better. 
it's the reputation is having a hard time getting built back up. So people are reporting on it. It's, it's getting better every day. I'm talking to navigators and certified application counselors. They're telling me they're having more enrollments every day. So it's looking better, but how much better? We don't really know because it's pretty anecdotal right now. So it, it, it is moving, but it is hard to repair that, that first impression there. Oh yeah, I mean, first there's people who, people who are politically against it, and so they never wanna go to it, and they're gonna keep spreading the word that it's really bad. And there are still some issues with it. It's not 100% better. And then plus you have people who've got the sticker shock. They went online, saw that the prices were more than they expected, or the narrow networks, and then they're spreading the word about that. So maybe some people who actually could get savings are afraid to even check it out. So enrollments are really low so far. We'll hear more about that in tonight's show with the young man who has an experience of just what you're talking about there as well. Okay, so with that big headline there, yeah. things getting lost that uh, maybe perhaps people don't know about that we need to know about or that kind of is flying under the radar a little bit. Well, first there's this study that just came out, and I think that this is something you should talk to the panel about, but they're saying that a lot of people are not healthcare insurance literate. They don't know the terms very well. They're getting mixed up, and so that could be part of the problem with people getting on to sign up for insurance or fill out an application. And a lot of people aren't tech savvy either. So it, there's, there's a lot of confusion out there. A, a lot has been dependent on people being tech savvy, it seems like. Yes, and that leads me to another point that I think, I won't say that it's not reported on at all, but I don't think that it's mentioned enough. Just because there's this December 23rd deadline does not mean that you should wait until December 23rd. Because first of all, it might be confusing to you. And then second, yes, the website still is not 100% reliable. There are issues. Don't, just, just like don't do your taxes on April 15th. Right, but people do it anyway, right? Yeah, well, some, <laughs> I won't name any names. But, um, okay, so you, you brought up deadline. Give us some more, what other deadlines are looming? What do they mean? Okay, deadlines have been changing a lot, so this can get pretty confusing. So okay. I'm gonna try to no. <laughs> simplify. If you, if you can make me understand it, everyone else will. Okay, so originally to select a plan, you had to do that by December 15th. That was pushed back to December 31st, okay? Mm -hmm. Or no, I'm sorry, December 23rd. Mm -hmm. I knew for a second there I was saying something <laughs> wrong. There's so many numbers. Okay, that was pushed back to December 23rd. To select a plan. To select a plan. Then it was um, December 31st. It was, geez, this is so hard. Okay, it was December 31st, so pay your premium. Uh -huh. Now they just moved it to January 10th. Okay, but that's not necessarily all insurers. Most insurers are going to push it back to January 10th, but you should call the insurance company and check. Now another thing is they ended up extending coverage through January for people in the federal pre-existing condition plan. Not people in the state pools, just the federal high-risk pool. State pools can extend it, but not necessarily Missouri, the General Assembly voted to end it on December 31st. Okay, so we've done a show about every month for the last year on yeah. this topic. You cover it for a living. Uh, this is confusing to us. How, how confusing is it for people out there who are working nine to five and then some, and oh, by the way, I gotta figure out health insurance. Oh yeah, and put on top of that, uh, Christmas is right around the corner, and New Year's when everyone's busy shopping, and they've got a lot of other stuff on their mind right now, um, but you have, through March to do this. So to, to avoid the penalty. To avoid the penalty, you have through March. So if you really need coverage in January, if you have a pre-existing condition. You've gotta or, get that done in December. Yes, or if you um, are a responsible person who's worried about having an accident or an illness turn up and you want your coverage by January, then you need to do that in December. But the penalty does not kick in until after March. So they think a lot of the young invincibles are going to wait. So why did, why did these changes happen? What, what, what was the, the catalyst for all these? For the deadlines moving back? Yeah, for all, for all these moving okay. targets here. Oh, sure. See, first there was the glitchy website that we've talked about, people not being able to get through. And when everyone was complaining about that, then, then when it started working better, then they started having issues at the back end. People would send their applications in and their information would be all jarbled. And now uh, there's people who are saying that their premiums that they turn them in, but then they're not getting confirmation that they were paid. So what was supposed to be paid by December 31st, um, and your coverage was supposed to start on January 1st, they were saying they were afraid that people were gonna show up at the hospital or show up to get their prescriptions and be told you're not in the system, you don't have any insurance. So now they're giving them through January 10th. In your reporting, are people keeping up with this? Are, is, this, is, this is this confusing people? Oh, I mean, I think unless you are following this every day, reading the news on it every day, reading healthcare.gov, most people probably aren't up to date on it. 
Okay, well, um, that's just a few things we will try to have the things we will try to answer yeah. tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Stick around because we'd like right. to, we'd like to hear from you again at the end of the show. Um, okay, so if if that confused us right now, there may be some questions that you have as well. Just as we do every week, we want to make sure you are a part of the show. Mr. Ed Reggie is here again to tell you how that happens. Ed, thanks, Casey. Well, as you've been hearing. For the last year, we've been talking a lot about healthcare. We've heard a lot from you on social media. And tonight, we want to know what you need to know about healthcare in 2014. So we're monitoring social media, and we want you to send in your questions, your comments, maybe what's missing from tonight's conversation. Now, you can join in several ways. One way is you could join, uh, log on to our Facebook, The Nine Network. We put a question up there. You could put your comments and your questions, and we'll use them throughout the night. Or you could uh, send us a, a tweet using the hashtag Stay Tuned STL, and we'll be bringing those tweets in throughout the entire broadcast. Here's what you've been already saying. Okay, in this table we want to talk specifically about insurance and coverage. Uh, so let me do some introductions first, uh, starting with Tim McBride. Welcome back to the show from University, or excuse me, Washington University. Emily Brimmer from Brim Brimmer Conley LLC, an insurance uh, broker working in the underwriting business, and Dr. Doug Pogue from BJC Healthcare. Thank you all for coming back to the show and all that you've taught us throughout the entire year. Let me, uh, let me table our table uh, for just a minute. And first, I want to introduce you to a, a, a man by the name of Jimmy, who has a success story, if you will, when it comes to navigating the system we are talking about. Um, my name is Jimmy Kovacs. I'm 26 years old. Um, I recently graduated from SLU Law in uh, 2013. So I was on my parents' plan. Um, I turned age 26 on February 2nd. So right during law school, the very last year. And then I was able to get an extension from the SLU care plan um, after graduation for a period of time. Now, I work at the law offices of David Balto. It's located actually in Washington, D.C., but I work um, here in St. Louis. Our practice is, is a small practice. Um, there's four attorneys. And so, therefore, we could pull together and have a small employer health care plan. Um, my Practice chooses not to do that. Yes, I'm a relatively healthy individual, but I'm just one slip and fall away from having very large medical bills. You know, I have seen people in prior circumstances, prior to the ACA, who didn't have insurance, who had accidents, and paid for it out of pocket. So I don't view any human being as invincible. I chose, I went on to the insurance exchange um, and I looked at the different plans. I ended up picking a silver plan and uh, with no subsidies, my plan ended up being $191 per month. But I saw plans on there that went as low as $115 um, for bronze level coverage. I've seen catastrophic plans essentially that go lower than that. And I would suggest that if people find that if the exchange doesn't work for them, then they should look at other sources as well. But I think getting covered is the most important part. Okay, so we're talking insurance and coverage. Um, but before we, we talk about some of the specifics I'd like to cover and, and, and go over that we've talked about throughout the year, I mean, we've got to talk about what we just talked about with Tara. I mean, we, that is a confusing conversation that we just tried to have. You saw one person who was able to finally make it happen. How, how, how much of a uh, problem are these deadlines and these moving deadlines to, to getting insurance, to getting coverage? I think it's been a rocky start to, the, to this part of Obamacare. One of the things I want to point out is, you know, we can probably get into this, is Obamacare is bigger than just the marketplaces. But the first months of October and November were tough. But I think some of this is getting better now in December because they fixed the federal government website and in Missouri is going through the federal government healthcare.gov. So a lot of that confusion with moving deadlines was because of the problems they had on the website. Well, and I think there's still, though, issues yeah. with the moving deadlines because, you know, when the, the president will get on TV and say, this, we're, we're doing this and this is what we're doing and this is what's going to happen, but 
it's not always that that's what's going to happen. It's maybe what that's what could happen. And, and it can be up to the insurance companies as well as if they're going to allow for some of those extensions. For example, when he moved the deadline to December 23rd, well, that was fine, except for the insurers who were selling off of the marketplace, many of them decided they wanted to keep that December 15th deadline. So we were then scrambling at the last minute trying to get people enrolled who were enrolling off of the marketplace before the December 15th deadline. So there's certainly a lot of confusion on the deadlines. This is a, uh, this, this, is this partnership working between the, the law and the private companies, the private insurers? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting partnership. I mean, certainly the plans have changed quite a bit. Uh, if you thought insurance was complicated before, just wait until you see these new plans. I mean, the way that they've had to structure them to make them comply with those metal levels um, because the, the bands that they have to fit into are so narrow that they've had to do some really interesting things to make the plans be bronze, silver, or gold. I mean, there have been some issues with that. And, you know, just getting everybody enrolled in through the system, the communication between healthcare.gov and the insurance companies is not ideal. I've put a number of people through healthcare.gov, and I am not showing on the other end as their broker or agent who helped them at all with one single one of them. So it's not ideal. Remind us why we want everyone to be insured. What, what, what is the bargain that was struck here with insurance companies in this law? What, what, and, and, and what is the benefit? Well, it, it, from a community standpoint, the benefit is huge. You want your population to have access to health care services. And that, and that benefits everybody. Despite all the political rancor that you hear about this, you know, Democrats will, will very much want this because they feel that the, the idea of the pursuit of life, liberty, and, and happiness Healthcare is intrinsic in that, in that you really can't do that without healthcare. And healthcare should be a fundamental right for everybody. Um, Republicans, on the other hand, still want the same thing, but for a different reason. You know, a healthy population is a productive population. It's not a dependent population. It's people who are working, creating things. You know, they have jobs, they pay taxes, they own things, that kind of thing. So you want a healthy population. It benefits everybody. But um, how that exactly is, is done is usually the, the sticking point. And, and just even just in that relationship you just mentioned with the insurance companies and, and the government, the changes themselves start to become problematic. For instance, just tonight they, they announced that because people have lost some insurance um, and then now they can't get it back, you know, the, the folks who were canceled when they had uh, previous uh, policies, well, so they just announced tonight, okay, we're going we're gonna to count those people as catastrophic um, uh, uh, health care eligible. So now you can, you can get, if you're in that position, you lost your plan, you can't get another plan, now we'll consider you catastrophic. So under the law, now you can go apply for a catastrophic plan, whereas previously they weren't allowed to do that. But that's, I mean, we're, we're sitting here on December 19th, and, and that's a very short notice to do that. So some, I think that relationship's being strained just because of all the changes. Right, and there's some issues too with that and that the, the catastrophic plans, I mean, they're not really that much different than the bronze plans just mm -hmm. because of that out-of-pocket cap that has to be on all of the plans. Um, but a lot of the people that are losing coverage in Missouri are losing coverage out of the high-risk pool. And these people have got some chronic conditions going on, some major health issues, maybe they take some expensive medications. And so a plan where they might have to come up with the first $6,300 before anything kicks in may not be a viable solution for them. People with chronic issues are losing coverage because I thought this was a situation where these were young, healthy people who were paying the very minimum and those policies were no longer good no, for the this, equation. The all. state high risk pool is closing December 31st and so you have a lot of people who've been paying into that program for many years who are losing their coverage. And the plan was always that they would come into the marketplaces or go on to Medicaid coverage and mm -hmm. because of the rocky start of Obamacare's website, that has been rough. But getting back to your original question about what's the stake here, I think, you know, Doug had it quite right, that I think the other, the other point I would make is that we all pay for this. We all have a stake in this. Mm -hmm. And so if you're paying insurance and you've had insurance forever, you've been paying for part of the cost of the uninsured. And so now we're going to pay for it in a different way. So I think that's really important. And estimates are that it's a few hundred to a thousand dollars per family plan. The other point is the providers have been carrying a lot of the burden of this for many years through charitable care, through uncompensated care, and we're now hopefully going to be able to ease that burden a bit and pay for it in a different way. This, uh, the, the risk and this responsibility has already been socialized to right. some degree. Mm -hmm.
but in a different way that's very haphazard and very inequitable and hopefully this will straighten that out. I know it's going to be rocky for a year or so, but yeah. And, and don't forget the, the payments that, for instance, Medicare makes to hospitals have been cut several times in right. the last several years with the bargain that we're going to, you know, we the government are going to pay you the hospital less, but you're going to now have less charitable care because everybody's going to have insurance who comes to your facility. So that deal only works if the, if the back end happens, if people really do have insurance coverage and, and um, you know, they're able to get health care that's, you know, it lowers the total burden of the, of the charity care. And they expected that people would have Medicaid coverage as well. As yeah. Right. About half the people that were supposed to get insurance nationwide were supposed to go on Medicaid before the Supreme Court decision. So the Supreme Court said what? And, and how did that ripple out into this, where so we are now? the Supreme where now. Court said it was a voluntary decision on the state's part. Originally in the law it says it was mandatory that you had to expand Medicaid. So after the Supreme Court decision, states could decide to opt in or opt out. And about half the states chose not to expand Medicaid, including Missouri. Um, so that leaves, uh, we have about 800,000 uninsured in the state, and, and the estimates are that about 250 to 300,000 would have been covered if we had expanded Medicaid. I think you are going to see a big uptick, though, in children's uh, um, going through Missouri Health Net because a lot of the people who are applying who qualify for the big tax credits through healthcare.gov are finding that mom and dad might be eligible for the subsidy, but the kids come back as a Missouri Health Net determination. So maybe a family that's paying for insurance for everybody right now is now going to be in a different situation next year where maybe the parents will be on an insurance policy with a subsidy and the children will be through Missouri Health Net. Ironically, we've seen nationwide that about two thirds of the people that are getting coverage are going on Medicaid. And these, a lot of these people were existing, they were eligible already, but they may not have known it. So they come to the system and they say, oh, you know, should I get coverage? And they say, well, you're already eligible, let's sign you up. So oddly, in states that aren't expanding Medicaid, we're going to have a Medicaid expansion. It's already 6,000 in Missouri. Any, yes. any so. chance that we will expand Medicaid as the law had intended 2014? I certainly hope so. I mean, we, we, need, to, we need to remember that uh, when the Accountable Care Act was, was passed, it was passed in a very rigid way in the sense that um, they never thought that Medicaid expansion would be optional. So with that now being off the table in states like Missouri, there are people who don't qualify for federal help but aren't really qualifying for Medicaid either and are kind of caught in that gap. And that can be very troublesome for folks that find themselves kind of in no man's land there. So since the end of the legislative session, our Missouri legislature in both the House and the Senate had interim committees to look at this issue of should we expand Medicaid. And um, there's now a proposal out of the House led by Representative Barnes and a proposal out of the interim committee of the Senate. They're very different. And uh, the House proposal does have a Medicaid expansion and it does have what they're calling Medicaid transformation. So I think if anything comes out of our legislature, it's going to call, be called transformation and reform of Medicaid maybe the expansion. The Senate is probably where the resistance is going to lie. Uh, lastly, here on uh, Twitter, the people are saying they're kind of sick of hearing about that broken website. Is that going to be something we remember this time next year? Will it all <laughs> be an afterthought? Great question. You know, I look back at the expansion of Medicare Part D, which is the prescription drug coverage, and I was involved in research projects on that. In the first few months were a nightmare. You know, pharmacists were complaining. People couldn't understand the website. I look back and for three weeks, they shut that website down. Mark McClellan in the George Bush administration went out to do a demonstration and the website crashed. And so they had to wait for a month to get it started. And yet, now you try to take that program away from the elderly, they go crazy. Well, yeah, but there are, a lot of them are buying it through the website. I mean, a lot of the seniors that I talk Maybe. to, when they right. sign up for Medicare Part D, they're either working with a, a Medicare agent that's right. helping them with a paper application or they're calling 1-800-MEDICARE and enrolling over the phone. But I would say the vast majority of them are not going online. And, and that's an important party. lesson we need to learn. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's, it's like there are many ways that people should get help. And it doesn't have to always go through the website. There are brokers like this. There are counselors, even your physicians, and you know, it, they can help. And maybe meet them where they are. That's something we'll talk about, uh, yeah. I think, later in the show, John. Okay, so thank you for what you have told us already on Twitter. Let's uh, go back to social media and see what else you're saying.
Okay, let's use the magic of uh, Google Hangout once again to leave the studio and uh, dial in to Washington, D.C. and bring into the show Rachel Dolan with the National Academy for State Health Policy. Rachel, thank you for being here. And I'd like, to, I'd like to start by asking you just to give us a, a bit of a national perspective. How are things going when it comes to the Affordable Care Act uh, differently state by state? How do you see different states uh, progressing or not in this new law? Sure. Well, just some background. Remember that the Affordable Care Act gave states some choices related to their marketplace. States could either set up their own marketplace or have a federal marketplace. And just to Later remind that, people, the market when we when we say marketplace, at one time we said exchange, and now we right. we're calling them the marketplace. This is where people can go, as we just talked about, and doesn't have to be on the website, but you you go on uh, and you can buy insurance uh, through the marketplace through different private companies. Right. Exactly. And, and so, so I, I, I interrupted. So go ahead. So different states. Yeah. So states could choose to set up their own marketplace have a federal marketplace, and then there was also added the option to partner with the federal government on a marketplace. Um, and so far, um, you know, at State Reform, we track the project I work on, um, state decisions related to marketplaces, and 15 states and D.C. are running their own marketplace. Nine states are partnering with the federal government, and 26 states, um, including Missouri, have a federal marketplace. So what are you and, seeing the difference there? How is it going for those who decided to set up their own state marketplace versus those who did not? Well, I think especially in the initial weeks, we saw that the state-based marketplaces were much more successful at getting, at getting folks enrolled than healthcare.gov. Healthcare.gov took about six weeks to get its issues fixed. Um, there are a couple of states that are still having some technical issues, but I think overall most state-based marketplaces have overcome any issues they had and are really seeing a large uptick in enrollments, especially in December. Can you give us, sometimes we need a little outside perspective of ourselves. Can you talk about um, Missouri for a minute and, and kind of give us your perspective from DC on how things are going in Missouri? Anything that gives us, uh, makes us unique right now? Sure, well, I mean, Missouri found itself in a situation over the past few years where there was a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature and they were sort of at odds over the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Democratic governor supported a state-based marketplace and the Medicaid expansion, but as you all just discussed, the Republican legislature is not really in favor of that. Um, and while in state government it's not really unusual for the governor and the legislature to be at odds, um, in your case, the legislature passed um, a bill that really prohibited the governor from setting up a marketplace using executive order. And that was, that was a measure that a number of other states used um, that their governors used when they couldn't get legislative support. So that kind of hamstrung Missouri and kept you all from having a state-based marketplace. And then the Medicaid expansion, you know, really will also need legislative support moving forward. Um, from the national perspective, how um, detrimental to the success of the law is Medicaid expansion uh, being an option for states? Well, I think if you think of one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act is expanding coverage, which it really is, the Medicaid expansion being optional, you know, certainly doesn't help that. Um, you know, the, the Medicaid expansion, obviously, as you mentioned earlier, wasn't designed to be optional. It was required. All states had to expand coverage to this new population. It was basically changing how Medicaid worked. Medicaid traditionally was a program that was aimed at certain categories of people, like uh, parents of dependent children, the elderly, and the disabled. And the Affordable Care Act was just gonna say, anyone under a certain income level will be able to get health insurance coverage. But now with it being optional, um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of people will honestly be too poor to get help, as, as odd as that sounds. They won't be able to qualify for tax credits, but you know, when the state doesn't expand Medicaid, they won't be, they won't be eligible for that help either. We've heard a lot about changing deadlines and other uh, uh, fixes or compromises, depending on your perspective, things that have changed in the rollout of this law from the, from the executive branch. Are you hearing any talk about uh, taking on that issue of Medicaid expansion at the state level, or is this just going to work itself out state by state? I think you're really going to see it work out state by state. Um, I think we've seen a couple of states proposing sort of different ideas than what was originally proposed in the Affordable Care Act. Um, Arkansas has gotten through a premium assistance model where they're going to use basically funding to buy folks um, that would have been in that expansion population 
um, private insurance coverage. And so I think you're seeing a couple of states moving to follow that model. So I think in the true sense of federalism, we're going to kind of see each state be a laboratory moving forward with the Medicaid expansion. And I think it, that's really how it will play out. Tell us what else you're working on. What are you tracking uh, with your organization? And maybe look into the future just a little bit for us. What will we be talking about next year? Sure. Well, I don't want to make too many predictions, but it is it is always good to remind folks that this, the decisions states have made so far aren't set in stone. So states do have the option to change their marketplace model in the future. States that are federal, federal marketplaces could move to a state-based marketplace in the future. States can also choose to opt into the Medicaid expansion in the future. And we've seen a couple of states um, so far submit proposals to expand Medicaid after 2014. I think another big thing to track next year will be the gubernatorial elections. There are 36 states that are having an election at the governor level, and that could really change some of those decisions that I talked about. You know, for example, Virginia just had an election in which they had a party turnover. and you know, already the new governor is potentially coming out in favor of the Medicaid expansion, whereas the previous administration wasn't in favor of it. So I think that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, do you see anything um, from, other than what you just talked about there with the election, are, do you see any sort of groundswell, any sort of activism from folks who either do or do not want Medicaid ex to expand? Is this something that's taking hold in any kind of a passionate way with people? Well, I think what will be interesting to see is in states where they're nearby or surrounded by states that have expanded Medicaid and mm. maybe have a state-based exchange, seeing the differences, you know, why does my neighbor in the state next door have health insurance and I'm not eligible? So I think maybe once people start to see how people that are pretty similar to them and are nearby them have different options than they do, then you might start to see people, you know, asking their, their legislature or their governor, you know, why is this the case? Why aren't these options available to me? Rachel Dolan from the National Academy for State Health Policy out of Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your time and for your perspective. Thanks very much. Okay, let's go back to you uh, on social media. That last question came from you on Twitter, so let's keep that going. Okay, so I kind of hinted just a second ago when we said, uh, you know, we were talking about does, does the website work for everyone that maybe you have to kind of meet people where they are. So let's uh, kind of take maybe policy and politics, maybe politics especially off the table for just a minute and talk about access and education. Let me first uh, introduce who we are talking about this with though. Uh, first we have Sam Pettyjohn, Health Literacy Missouri. Thank you, Sam, for being here. Dr. Denise Hooks Anderson, physician and SLU assistant professor. Thank you for being here as well. And Nick Samankovich, who actually is wearing a different tie. I, I just consider I you a that's friend. That's the only part of the outfit that changed, Casey. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, I think the most important part is that you're always uh, sharply dressed <laughs> and, and present yourself well. Uh, an MD, PhD candidate at, the, at Washington University. Um, okay, so uh, a few things that we've touched on throughout the year. Uh, maybe some topics we've done shows on almost each of these uh, words like access, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a phrase like primary care, uh, health disparities. How do, how do those things play into this conversation about uh, the, the the health of our health care? Well, I think they're they're a big positive role. I, we talked earlier in the show about you know the exchanges and how things have not worked out. You got to remember that's a, a, just a, a fraction of what happens in, in the Affordable Care Act, right? It's an important part. Insurance is very important, but a lot of the, the act focuses on things like access to preventive care, access to health literacy. Uh, it focuses on, on things like improving outcomes at hospitals. And you know, one thing that that worries a lot of hospitals now is that their payments may be reduced if they have worse outcomes for patients. And that's one part of the Affordable Care Act that, that they're going to look at actually outcomes of surgery and say if your outcomes are, are worse than the region we'll reimburse you a little less so so the people keep coming back it, because they haven't been fixed exactly mm -hmm. and and so things like the 30-day readmission rate is what you're talking about so I think that um, it's important to remember that you know insurance is a huge part of this but but there are other huge components of the act that that are, are actually I think uh, very good ideas and we'll see how they work out sure some of that getting lost in all the talk about websites and whatnot oh, please well, go ahead. I was gonna say the other issue a very important issue is that just because you get this card in your hand, the other issue will be 
where are those primary care docs to take care of them? Because that's going to be a huge, huge part of that, is that they're, they're, they're going to have to have more primary care docs for this amount, this huge influx of people that are coming. We have an actual shortage in primary care Absolutely, physicians. absolutely. And think about how complex it is to be a patient. So uh, just think about the last time you went to the doctor. Uh, there's a lot of things you have to do. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Um, just understanding how your insurance works, understanding uh, the layout of a primary care facility, understanding all the little kind of ins and outs that we kind of grew up with in the medical system. And we have a bunch of people that now have access mm -hmm. to care for the very first time, and they're going to be entering that system. There's going to be a lot of questions, uh, a lot of concerns, a lot of barriers for people in that population. And if we don't address those things, uh, we're going to see some, some really um, negative health care outcomes. We're going to see some major problems in uh, kind of getting the results we want from this act. I think part of the, the inspirational thing about, about these problems is, you know, this gives us a lot of room for improvement. We can address these problems with preventive care. We can address these problems with health literacy. One interesting component of the act is, is it tries out things called bundled payments. So this was an idea that was started actually many years ago in the 1980s. One of the places that did this was uh, actually the conservative Texas Heart Institute, where when you go in for a heart procedure, rather than paying for every single thing that happens rather than being billed for you know the time that the nurse spends and being billed for this procedure being billed for this imaging being billed for the CT scan the entire interaction is billed as one thing kind of bundled payments of that and, and uh, people don't know yet whether that'll be a good thing or a bad thing as these are rolled out but we're trying them now and this brings in the idea of well gosh if people end up with worse outcomes if they don't understand what's going on in healthcare that's gonna end up costing us money we're gonna have to figure out how to improve education so that we can reduce those costs right. so th there are a lot of cool things in the act that are focused on improving, I think, literacy and, and access to care. Definitely. We know that there's a lot of problems with uh, just poor communication between uh, providers and patients and patients understanding discharge instructions. And if patients don't understand the, the things they need to do to go home to be healthy, to be able to manage their own health, uh, that's where you see a lot of readmissions. And if we're not working to address those things kind of in that hospital environment, in that primary care environment, uh, again, we're going to have some major problems when it comes to uh, getting the patients as healthy as we need them to be for this thing to be successful. I mean, it's, it can be hard to ask your doctor questions. Now your doctor is in higher demand and has less time to sit and chat, mm -hmm. it's got to be even harder. I mean, it's a huge issue um, because as he's mentioning, these, these patients are complex. You got to imagine if you have not had health insurance for years, I'm sure there are lots of preventive tests you have not had done. There are, there are lots of blood draws. There are all of these, these different items that we need to cover, immunizations, um, certain tests like colonoscopies, mammograms, all of these things that you've never had. So that's very time consuming in a 15, 20 minute visit, uh, trying to get through 20, 25 patients uh, in a day. So it's very complex, and so it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to introduce them to the system, mm -hmm. to get them used to the system, to understand what does this mean? What does this medication do? You know, where do I go? You know, how do I access this? I mean, I have patients that don't even understand how to get a refill. I mean, they think they have to have their bottles. They don't know that you can call, you can scan it on a phone, you know, that you don't have to just show up to the pharmacy to get a refill. And are they sold that they need to go to the doctor when they're not, when they're not hurting? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, that's a big fight. Uh, trying to teach patients that, you know, you come to the doctor before you get sick. This is preventative medicine. Uh, this is what I do. I mean, teaching them that what we're trying to do is prevent disease. So the, the fact that I'm asking you to get a colonoscopy is to check to make sure that you don't have colon cancer, that if you have that polyp, that we can remove it before it develops into colon cancer. I, that's a big sale. I mean, I spend a lot of time educating patients on that, that very uh, aspect of, of their care. And that's a much different experience than a lot of these patients have had before. A lot of times uh, these uninsured patients have accessed the system through the emergency room, uh, through a feder federally qualified health clinic, through a public health department, uh, really where they are sick and they come uh, uh, seeking kind of immediate care. And uh, teaching uh, a patient population to use the primary care system as a, a preventative measure uh, is going to be a, a massive undertaking in all of this. It's going to be a huge change. You know, I, I've seen patients, uh, hypertension has been a lot in, in the news this past week as some new guidelines were updated. I've seen a number of patients who are on hyper antihypertensive medications because you know, they, have, they have chronically very high blood pressures, but they only take their medications when they have a crushing headache, when right. they feel really, really bad. That's right. the one time they take it and they, they come and see you and they start developing complications and you say, well, what's going on? And they say, well, I don't know, every time I feel terrible, I pop a couple of these pills and then I feel a little better. And right. I think that, that we don't do a good enough job of educating people that, you know, th this is a preventive care. It takes a while. So mm -hmm. I, I'm the one that said we were taking politics off the table. So I offer this question in a very apolitical way a as possible. But is this very group of people you're talking about getting bigger? We just heard about the lack of Medicaid expansion. Is this group that you're talking about while you're trying to educate them 
actually growing on you at the same time? Certainly is. There, there are many people that don't have insurance. There are a lot of chronic health problems in the United States as we progress through diabetes and obesity uh, that lead to a lot of complications. I think the, the interesting thing that's changed now is there's more of a financial incentive for hospitals and insurers to provide people with more preventive care. Not only is that a requirement as part of the law, but for hospitals, we, we talked about the 30-day readmission rate. And if they have a, a patients that keep coming back and back for the same problems after they were immediately discharged, they'll lose substantial percentages of, of their revenues. They actually will cut 1% of medical Care and Medicaid reimbursements. That goes up to, I think, 2% maybe around now. It increases over time. So there are real incentives for uh, both the, the private parties, the hospitals, the academic institutions to, to solve these problems, because otherwise it's going to cost them the bottom line. Well, I mean, and there are other issues as well. I mean, we're talking about, I, I think, the big picture, but something as simple as co-pays. I mean, I can refer a patient to a specialist, and they'll tell me, doctor, I just don't have the $40 to go see my specialist. I just don't have that right now. I'm like, well, you have this ab abnormal finding on your CT. You, you need to see the specialist. I just can't afford it right now. I'm afraid of what that's going to be or, or something like that. So, I mean, we're talking about the big picture, but the smaller picture, sim something as simple as a copay. This and has been the real... terms we use, I would like to say, uh, just the fact that we, we call these things all these different things, we call it a copay instead of just a payment you need to make uh, you know, you know, it, to pay for your health care in this situation. We have a whole different language around uh, medicine as well as health insurance. And if you're not familiar using that system, uh, that you're going to see some real problems when it comes to being able to communicate exactly what's going on in your body, going on with an insurance system, understanding all the different things you have to do. So until we're able to, to make the language a little easier for people to understand and relate to, uh, we're going to see barriers there as well. I, I I remember trying, uh, coming out of college, figuring out, oh, I'm sorry, the deductible and then the premium. Right. And then I had the fortune of having parents to explain it to me and, and, and having the ability to pay for the insurance at, with, with the job. But I'm sorry. Well, you were, you were also saying, look, is this getting bigger? Well, I wanted to bring up the issue just locally. Um, Connect here closed. And so that was a huge deal. That was a, our safety net for patients who were uninsured. So patients that didn't have insurance, if you needed a specialist, you could go to Connect Care and could see a gastroenterologist or you could see a surgeon or whatever specialty. Now that that, uh, that is closed, where are they going? They have nowhere to go to get uh, follow-up care uh, for a colonoscopy or for uh, you know, an abnormal finding. So that's a huge issue. And so are there things in this law that can help with what we're talking? You talked, touched on it a little bit, but are there things in this law that you think can help? Well, yes, if they have coverage, right. um, because a lot of these patients didn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. They were going, mostly going to connect. Can it help with the, with the literacy as well? Is there something to help you in that battle too? Well, uh, as long as we have, uh, we need to work on patient empowerment in all of these things. Uh, teaching patients uh, the way to better communicate with their physicians, but it's easier in a sense to, to work from a system level and start communicating with the hospital systems, working with the physicians, the nurses, uh, around best practices in verbal communication, uh, best practices in written communication, um, offering uh, brochures about quitting smoking that are written at a level the average person can, can easily understand. And if we can work to, do, uh, to address all these issues, then hopefully we can see a more informed and more empowered patient base that's better able to kind of manage their own care in a sense. Optimistic? I know you are. I'm right? always optimistic. AC, I think things will work out well. Oh, oh, absolutely. Are we moving in the right direction? Absolutely. I mean, I, I've always had the attitude that, you know, it's cheaper to prevent, it, uh, prevent disease than to try to take care of it in mm -hmm. the end. So to me, it just makes sense. Okay. We'll leave it there. And because I want to introduce you to someone, uh, we were headed over now to the home of Alive and Well. And this is a radio show broadcasting information, a lot like what we're talking about right now to the people we're talking about right now, I believe. Alive and Well STL is a radio show that was born out of a need to help people that are in the community every day who may not read the reports and look at the maps to really understand what issues are impacting their community. Today we will be discussing New Year's commitments or resolutions if that's what you do and ways that we can all start off the year to have a happy and healthy 2014. The format is 15 minutes on purpose because people need information quick, get in, get out, and know what to do about it. 2014 has lots of changes to healthcare and insurance, as I'm sure we have all heard with the marketplace and the debate around Medicaid expansion. What do people need to do to get access? In order to get access, you have to take advantage of what's available to you. What's available to you today, um, first and foremost, is the healthcare marketplace if you don't have insurance from your place of employment. The type of um, questions that people are asking are, what is Medicaid 
what is Medicaid expansion? The main question is, what can we do about um, it? Some of this may not be new, but we'll just say it again. I think the biggest issue and misperception is that feeling of being overwhelmed. There's a lot of information that's coming out. And um, not knowing how to take action steps toward what people are learning it seems to be the biggest challenge. Provider. How does having health insurance help someone to stay healthy? ACA has almost forced or compelled providers of care, hospitals, health centers, public health departments, to think about things in ways that they've been dreaming to do, and it, this gives them the vehicle to get it done. So now a person can understand how to engage in healthcare, not from a, I have to, or I gotta do it when I'm sick, or I have to go to an emergency room, but what can I proactively do? What questions uh, do I need to ask? What benefits am I entitled to now? James, that before were just a dream. So regardless of what side of the fence that you're on about the issue, having a conversation about health has come out of this, and I think that's really critical. When it comes to health, it's really very simple. Make up your mind to make one change. And from the momentum that you get from making the one change, you build momentum and optimism and hope to change your community. What will it look like to be alive and well in 2014? Thank you so much. Thank you, that is good. This is a topic so big we had to bring everyone back to the table to try to Wrap it up. We'll, we'll talk about this more next year, but we wanted to try to, you know, uh, cover a lot of what we've covered this year and make sense of a lot of what we've talked about this year. I think there was a lot that we were just starting to touch on. We, I think in that last table, it was almost like we packed three shows into one segment of one show. <laughs> so I want to just spend a little bit more time on that, and then I want to go to Ed after that. But so, so um, this is uh, kind of our post show on the show, as you guys, if those of you who've been here before, have done uh, our post show with us before. The health disparities is something that we sort of touched on there in that last segment. We've done a whole show on it before. Are there barriers to what we're talking about to certain groups in our community? And, and what, what do we mean when we say health disparities? We touched off mentioning one, which is that Connect Care closed, and that was a huge asset to the community that um, ha has been, I think, a real disaster. I think maybe you can um, speak a little bit more to this. Those patients don't have a lot of places to go, and they turn up into emergency rooms. Um, for those that can end up getting care, and I think for those that don't, um, they end up with chronic complex diseases that we pay for down the line when they end up on Medicare or Medicaid. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, the, 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 that was a really valuable asset in the community where folks who otherwise didn't have any place else could go could could go there could see the same the same provider for instance you know uh, over time for several months or even a couple of years there are folks who volunteered there are physicians and nurse practitioners who volunteered their time there and really took great care of people for the resources that they had and so that was a big loss so what's taking its place well right now nothing um, so folks are, are kind of spreading out they wander into our emergency rooms or others around town they uh, they try to show up at regional health clinics and and see if they can get in there or try to find some providers. Um, but that's group, interestingly enough, is, as we've kind of talked about, oh, well, uh, the population will sign up for insurance, will sign up for this or that. You know, those folks have the hardest time even knowing what their options are, what their, what, you know, what's available to them, uh, how to sign up. They don't necessarily have computers uh, per se or other things, and so it's, it's, it's very difficult. And so it's a real outreach that needs to happen to them to try to bring them into the tent. Even, and two, once they get on the computer and they try to sign up for a program, it's not so easy to be able to compare the plans, particularly for the provider networks, to find something that's in their area. Because if you're in the city and you want to have access to Barnes Hospital or you want to have access to you know, BJC or, um, or SLU, you know, not all the plans have those. I mean, some people are hearing, well, all I need to do is get a Coventry plan. Coventry has BJC, the BJC system in it. But the Coventry, that's the Coventry PPO network. There are Coventry CareLink network plans that are also on the marketplace, and those are Mercy and SSM only. So if you pick a Coventry CareLink plan, and they're not bad plans and they're less expensive, but they are a more limited network. So if you do choose one of those plans, you need to be aware that you're not having access to the full network. And then the Anthem plans, which everybody has been sort of talking about and aware of, do not have the BJC network as well, but they do have 
um, St. Louis University Hospital. So one of the great points that's bringing up is the whole issue of literacy. And I think one of the challenges we're going to see as we face moving forward, I mean, I think a lot of the changes that are really good are, are people getting coverage. But we're now going to uncover, as we peel the onion, uh, how people actually navigate the system and can they do a very good job at it. So we're talking, you know, we're talking about people that may never have had insurance before, may never have had it for a long time. That might be challenge in terms of not having much education or they might have English as a second language or something like that. And can they navigate some of these complex issues that we just mentioned? Do they know what a premium is, a deductible, a copay, a coinsurance? Can they know what networks mean? Do they know? And so they may be used to going to the emergency room at Connect Care, so they have to learn a whole new way of getting health care. Not even those so, people. I work with very bright, well-educated people right. who have a hard time understanding coinsurance and premiums and deductibles. And, I feel better. You know, so. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I want to be able to They're label myself alone. as positively as possible. That's yeah. good. I mean, enrollment is only the first step in all of this. Right. And after that, it's a matter of uh, uh, paying your premium, uh, keeping the policy over uh, a length of time, and then understanding how that policy uh, gains you access to care. And if you can't... Uh, kind of figure out all three of those things, then there's going to be barriers for you in the system. And in using it. And correct. In using it. In using your health care uh, to get health care and hopefully have a much better health outcome. And if, if you're unable to do those things uh, just because you have a lack of understanding around uh, the instruction, um, the language you, you uh, have on your plans and, and you get from the providers is unclear, uh, there's going to be major, major issues in, in getting care and having a positive health outcome. I, I want to back up for just a second because am I getting the wrong picture here that um, we, we're talking about with Connect Care closing that you have a a level of people who are getting more coverage or, or people who are more people who are getting covered and then at the same time people are kind of getting left out it's a kind of it's like getting better on one end and fraying at the other end is, is that it? part of the problem is is we're in Missouri here to be honest with you and we we made a we made some decisions as our legislature did that are we are now seeing some of the ramifications of it to be honest that's part of the story so not expanding Medicaid is created a big hole in the safety net and we would have brought in 1.5 to $2 billion this year, which would have really helped connect care and much of the safety net. That's not the whole story. As Doug pointed out earlier, there have been cuts to Medicare payments. There have been readmission penalties that like BJC has been paying. And there's the sequester cuts. You know, people have to remember when we, we passed budget cuts, we passed a lot of that to Medicare too. So you put all that together, you're going to be challenged in any one of the states, but you're going to be more challenged in a state that didn't expand Medicaid. And we haven't even touched on mental health. You're talking about disparities. Right. Mm -hmm. We haven't even started discussing that yet, and that's a huge issue. So these same people who are uninsured and with Connect Care closing and not even having access to that type of you know, emergency care or urgent care, again, a lot of those had mental disease. So again, we're talking about a very fragile part of our population that they're, they're not getting services because of this budget cut. I, I feel like I do have to speak for some of the folks we've had on the show here who have said why would we put more money into a system that they see as broken, that system being Medicaid, why would we expand something that's not working? Well, I mean, uh, I actually challenge the point that Medicaid's not working. There's a lot of good evidence out there that Medicaid, if you compare the Medicaid system as challenged as it is to being uninsured, there's no doubt all the data suggests that Medicaid is much better than being uninsured. It's not as good as Medicaid, as, uh, Medicaid's much better than being uninsured. It's not as good as Medicare or private insurance. We have a sort of a four-tier system. So I don't think Medicaid is broken. Um, and sure, could we fix it? Could we transform it? Absolutely. There's always reforms that can be made. But the other thing is, remember what we talked about earlier, the dollars that would flow into Medicaid, there are dollars on the other side that are gonna be used to pay for this. We now will have less uncompensated care, that's accounted for on the other side. So it's not like this is just adding dollars onto the budget. And the Congressional Budget Office said it was roughly budget neutral. Yeah, and, and, and expanding Medicaid and bringing people into the health care tent and reforming Medicaid or being creative about how we organize Medicaid, maybe how we interact as a healthcare community around Medicaid, those are not mutually exclusive things. We, could, we can expand the tent, bring people in, and work hard on what are the best ways really to care for people? What are innovative models we can try at different facilities to try to make Medicaid more efficient or less expensive, that kind of thing? Um, we need to bring people into the tent first and, and right. get them get them into the system where they can actually get the help that they need. And and the healthcare community in general already is really changing right now. It's a big time where um, where all the big health systems in town and other folks are are trying to change how they do business. They're really really rethinking their models given the the, the changes in healthcare. 
And so it, it's a great time to say, okay, come on in and let's figure out how to take care of you. That, that's, we can do that. How many people are in tent right now? What's, the, what's our percentage of uninsured in Missouri? It, it's roughly about um, 15%, 14 to 15%. Okay, so for the other, for the other 85%, what does this law, how, how does this have an, an impact on, on the, the lives of that other 85%? Well, if you use the exchange, they have one big thing that they've got to make sure they take care of, which is the, the conversation we had earlier tonight about some plans in which healthcare systems are in or not, or individual physicians may be in or not. If, if uh, those part of those 85% are going to get, um, uh, in, they have insurance now, but they're going to get new insurance under the exchange, one of the first things they need to do is they need to call their doctor if they have, if they have one, or there are several doctors if they see different folks, and ask what they're participating in. I, I'm really worried that in the first quarter of 14, we're going to see the law of unintended consequences show up, where people went on, they looked at the plans, they said, oh, this looks like a good plan for me or for my family. They signed up for that, and with one click of a mouse, they just wiped out every physician they see, and they can't see them now for the next year. I'm sorry, Ed, I, 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 you've been so quiet, I'm yeah, going to have to talk to you know. sooner. So represent <laughs> well, for Twitter you know, here for us real quick. We talked about it, uh, mental health was brought up, you know, how, where does that fit in this? And, and I think, you know, generally we heard a lot of tweets tonight about this is so, this is very confusing. Mm -hmm. and, and just maneuvering, especially for people that had never had it before. And so, you know, looking for 2014, how are they going to maneuver in this new field, this new opportunity for them? So that's really something that really it came out a lot. You can't you, you kind of go in the system, you need someone to stay with you when you get in there. And even for the 85% that have had it before, I mean, they're really confused yes. too. There are a lot of people who come to us saying things yeah. like, well, I want Obamacare, so I have to go to the website. Well, maybe they don't even qualify for the subsidy. They don't have to go to the website. They could go to a broker or agent. They could go to ehealthinsurance.com, a web broker. I mean, I'm, there's other resources. I'm not cutting you off. I'm just interrupting. Uh, let's let's say good night on the, on the on the air, but we're going to stay online and we'll continue this conversation there. So stay tuned online. Thank you. Thank you. Nine's health coverage is supported in part by the Missouri Foundation for Health. Yeah. Okay. So Emily just said we're going postal. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because we're having a post post show. A post post show. I, I was thinking about cereal. Ed was thinking about mail. I don't know. It's just like a whole different kinds Most of post. Po okay, anyway. Um, so, I'm oh, sorry, finish your thought. Oh, just that, you know, even for the 85% of people who do have insurance, you know, I mean, this, this is a confusing process. A lot of them don't realize that they don't have to go to healthcare.gov, right. especially if they're not eligible for the subsidy. And in fact, if, if a block of those people would get out of the website, it could free up some space on that website and maybe reduce some of the glitches for the people who really do need it. Um, so I think that's one thing. Hmm. I think people who don't need to worry about this at all because they have employer coverage or they have an existing plan that they can keep for a while that may not renew until sometime later in the year. This isn't this doesn't have to be a race to December 23rd for them. You know, they do have some time and I think it's important for them to be thoughtful about the decision that they're making. Can you explain, just real quick because I've got you're the expert on this. Can you just kind of briefly explain why some people had their policies canceled? I mean, what, what, oh. was, what was the kind of, what's the philosophical reason why those okay. policies were no longer worthy. All right. Well, there's two different issues. There's people who had their policies canceled because they were like in the Missouri high risk pool and it just got shut down or they were with Aetna and Aetna just terminated all of its policies, mm. 1231 in Missouri, because they bought Coventry and they were deciding that they were going to do their individual policies through Coventry and they weren't going to sell through Aetna anymore. So do we so, have more canceled in Missouri than other places? No, not necessarily for those reasons, but you, there's a whole other side of this. I lost it and my plan was canceled. Okay. So the other part of it is this. Every single not grandfathered plan, okay, every single plan that was written on, you know, March 24th, 2010 or later or changed that's non grandfathered, all those plans have to go away because they're not compliant with the metallic levels. They're not compliant with the, um, with the new benefit requirements. With the quality of coverage. Right. So if you had an individual policy that was non-grandfathered, you can't keep what you have. And why? Why was that bad for this system? Why, Tara, help us out or anybody else? So, you know, so I think the main point is that the, the law tried to regulate what, uh, what's called insurance. Mm -hmm. So the, in, the main thing they did around that was what was just mentioned about essential benefits. So they defined in the law what an insurance plan should include and what is essential for it to include. And if a plan didn't include those, it was not grandfathered in, it was just discussed. And so you may have had something that was called insurance, but it's not currently regulated to be qualified. And then so you have to switch plans. That's 
And were essentially we not, what happened. And, 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 but then people got really mad because Obama right. had said, if you like your plan, right. you can keep it, which was he was he misspoke. And so when everyone started getting angry and there's already a lot of crap that's been thrown at Obama this past year, he decided to ask them to extend it for another year. So a lot of people got those what was canceled plans, got them extended for at least another year. I don't know that he totally misspoke, actually, in that I think one of the big problems with this law and its implementation is that so few people involved in it really understood the insurance industry and how it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, they, I don't think they really fully understood the ramifications of some of the changes mm -hmm. that, were, that were in the law. You know, we'll have to see, we'll find out from the history books why he said what he did. <laughs> I, I've heard actually that it was probably a political decision. I think that the policy people, like the health economists, like people that I know, told him, don't say that. People can't well, understand the nuance well, of they, it? Well, you know, he could have said something like, most of you will keep your plans, or if you have a you know, it, you know, they were trying to tighten, tighten but, up the but, language. But a the, bit. the political types came in and said, "Don't say that mm -hmm. because you're going to get rammed and you're going to get nailed." And I, frankly, I think that's what happened. And you know, so the, the the thing to keep, and it gets back to the helicopter level that we need to keep track of the 85 percent or so the people who already have coverage. So if you have a stable stable employer and you've been in your insurance for a while, it's probably not going to change. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to worry very much about this. And so what we're talking about with these people who've had to change plans is a fairly narrow part of the you know, population. Right. It, you know, uh, these people matter and it's not well, uh, inconsequential to them. But remember the other thing about our insurance market is they've been complicated for a long time. And, you know, I've had my insurance plan change probably 12 times in my life. And, you know, my employer says, oh, you're in, you're in United Healthcare now, you're yeah. in, you know, Aetna now, you're, you know, it, it changes. And you, you, people have had to deal with this, even if they've been, I've been covered my entire life. So, and you deal with changing your doctors, changing your networks, changing your plans. And, you know, that's not to belittle these problems, but it's, you know, it's been a rocky place it, for a didn't, long time. I, I, wanna, I kinda wanna move on to something, we got a lot of other, but just, it, yeah. were some of those people they were healthy and they had such little coverage that we were just not getting enough money out of them for the system. Some right? of them entirely, that's true. I okay. think there's young males probably that yeah. bought pretty cheap plans, but some of them might, they and just couldn't them, have afforded And we much. need them to pay a bigger share and yeah. not use the doctor. The tough much. part is those people who had, <laughs> No, that, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not right, I'm asking. No, no, I agree, I'm just referring to that's myself as a young male. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. That's how an insurance pool works. You yeah. need to get people to pay. And the truth of the matter is, I think we all knew this, those were those who were doing research on it, there were gonna be people who are gonna be losers. Right. And that, that happens when you change policy. And I would argue that people would be shocked if they knew how little was actually covered in some of those plans that they had bought. Yes. Um, and, and if they had an emergency. The people who owned the plans. If they, the people yeah. owned the plans, well, if they showed up. I, dis so. I actually, I, I disagree, because most of the individual policies in Missouri covered almost every essential health benefit that they required. I mean, the Anthem Blue Cross, and that they are the 2,000 pound gorilla for individual medical policies in Missouri, right? Those Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, they had unlimited lifetime limits already. They didn't have annual dollar limits on most benefits already. They covered hospitalizations and prescriptions and doctor's office visits, the emergency room, urgent care, all of those things. The big thing that they didn't cover really was maternity. Now that was an issue, and there were certainly a lot of women who were falling into that gap of not being able to get a policy with maternity, so that was a problem. But the rest of the essential health benefits, most of those individual insurance plans really did cover all those things from before. Well, people in the pre-existing condition pool, they didn't get, I mean, their, their coverage was either really expensive or they were turned away though, so I mean, right. you really right. can't ignore that. Oh no, absolutely yeah. not. If you could qualify for it, you could get great inexpensive mm -hmm. coverage. But if you couldn't qualify for it, you had to go in the high risk yeah. pool, that was a big problem because mm -hmm. those plans weren't the same and they were very expensive. And if you could even afford the high risk pool because a lot of people didn't even turn yeah. to it. And, yeah. so, and just to be clear, this would this is easier than if we'd have gone to a universal single payer <laughs> health care system? <laughs> uh, I don't you want know, to it's, <laughs> you know, e universal coverage through the government is probably the easiest way to do it. But you know, could we have got that accomplished in this country? I frankly don't that's think so. Show, I yeah, think. that's yeah. a whole other show. So I think that's a whole so other year probably, of shows. Probably one of the easiest things. Starting to do. with some yeah, sort of like so. McCarthy test of our uh, right. of our loyalties. Yeah. I don't know. It would have been easy, but libertarians don't like it. And, yeah, you know, no, a lot so of people don't. A lot of people. So I, I don't think you would stop a libertarian. I think a lot, know, lot of people would. Again, I think there's a lot of 
understanding and health literacy and all of those things mm -hmm. involved in that. So again, a whole other show. Okay, well maybe we'll do that show. I don't know, Ed, do you think we're gonna take I'll a- I'll book it right now. Take a note, <laughs> <laughs> Done. Okay, um, I think we're just about out of time on the line, so we'll just stop there, I guess, uh, guys. Thanks for all of your help all year, too, as well. So thank you thank for you. doing the show. Happy New Year. It's been Thank fun you. to make friends with you guys. And for those